example, if uh, you are not able to be with us in person, that's okay. Uh, you can find access to this study uh, through our Facebook, on YouTube, and uh, generally we do the study in person uh, on Tuesdays, but by the time it is edited, uh, and it takes a while to take away all my mistakes, and it doesn't leave a whole lot left when it's done, now that I think about it. But anyway, whatever, it'll be on Wednesdays, and word will get out to you. Uh, be looking to our Facebook, you, or you might get a text letting you know that it is there for you to access. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention at this time, uh, and that is uh, next Sunday we will have communion. So those of you who are worshiping online, please uh, be mindful of this. You can gather your elements uh, together and be prepared. Uh, for uh, communion with us uh, next Sunday morning, uh, but we will do that and we'll continue to do it as we have been doing through the COVID experience. We're not quite ready to go back to passing the plate, so, uh, be, but you will have uh, access to both uh, the bread and uh, the uh, juice uh, as we have communion together, and that's next Sunday morning. <coughs> so please keep that in mind as well. Uh, this is also a special time, a special day for some others in our church family, and I'm going to ask for Jackie to come and share these moments with you at this time. Good morning. Um, today is uh, the day that we're going to celebrate our graduates. We have two graduates in our congregation this year, one from high school and one from um, her master's degree. And so the first one I have, I have a picture of well, Miss Taylor is graduating from Oak Mountain High School and she will be attending Barry College in the fall. <laughs> and our second graduate, I'm not sure where she went, but it's Christy Peters and she graduated from UAB with her Masters of Public Administration. And she did that while pregnant, she did that while a new mom, and she did that while she was in the midst of a pandemic. So congratulations to Christy, and I have a little gift for her when she gets in here. All right. Very special, very special occasions for both. And we are proud of uh, both Christy and Taylor. Taylor, you're still a little baby in my eyes. I cannot, I cannot see you as a high school graduate. I'm sorry, it's just so hard to imagine. You grew up overnight while I was away. And I, but I am so proud of you. And, uh, and I know that both you and uh, Christy are gonna make us all proud. Uh, those are the announcements to share with the church family uh, this morning. Uh, I have none other to share with you, so at this time, we'll go ahead and prepare our hearts for uh, our worship together. Let us pray. Father, as we come before you again, we are excited about the opportunity to be together with you in this manner. We've looked forward to this time uh, during the week while we have been able to worship you and, and fellowship with you uh, uh, in our other places and, uh, and sometimes in, in the privacy of, of our homes or wherever. It's, it's good to come together as a family too. So thank you for giving us the uh, opportunity for the strength, the ability to be able to do so. And, and for those gathering with us online, we, we thank you again for their love for you and their love for their church and their love for your word. And we all come with hungry hearts, uh, hearts that are outpouring to you in praise and with thanksgiving, but hearts that are hungry as well to fellowship with you and to hear from you uh, as you share your heart with us today as well. So lead us uh, in, in this service today. Uh, through your spirit be upon us fill us overflow father in our hearts that we leave here with uh, with a song in our lips that we leave here with a, a testimony that is we are ready to and, and desiring to share with others give us the opportunities lord and we will try to be faithful in, in every way in which you uh, afford us those opportunities but thank you for these moments right now again bring us together in the oneness of your spirit we ask in jesus name Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing this morning.
Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. We serve a, a wonderful Lord. One of the things that I cherish over the, my uh, 
lifetime since God became real for me through his son Jesus are the relationships that I formed. And some of those relationships I formed early on in my Christian walk. And I happened to find uh, via the internet, which we don't always get along, but in this case, something very good happened. I found one of those friends. Bob Hellman was his name, is his name, and he uh, resided in uh, Mobile, Alabama, but we actually met at Bethel uh, College, which is Bethel University now, years ago, in 1969. And Bob and I were friend, became good friends, but we lost touch with one another, as sometimes the case. And he was called to preach God's word, as I had been called to do. And yet he was not a Cumberland Presbyterian. He went uh, in a different direction, therefore. And I always wondered what happened to him. And I found him. He's preaching in a church up in Huntsville, Alabama, not too far from here. So I uh, found his church's website and I, I emailed him and I reminded him that I was at one time his best friend. <laughs> Some people forget these things, so you have to remind them. <laughs> so, but I told him that I had, I had thought of him often, and that's the truth, over the years. And I was so glad. I did, said, I'm not trying to get anything going here. I just want you to know that I, God put a love in my heart for you, and I still love you, and I still pray for you, and that God will continue to bless you and bless your, your ministry. And uh, I hope he got the message, because uh, it certainly was from my heart to his. Another relationship that I formed some years later, but still some time ago at that, was here at the Rocky Ridge Church. When I, I pastored here for the first time, uh, one of the members of my church was a man by the name of Jack Oliver. And some of y'all will remember Jack. Yeah, Jack and his dear wife, Dot. Uh, Jack and I became friends. There were no two people any different from one another than Jack and myself. And yet we really enjoyed being together. Strange as that may sound, we had enjoyed talking with one another, though we were both way apart and trying to find a way to get closer. Well, the reason I share this with you is because as we go to the Lord in prayer today, I want you to remember his family. Uh, one of his children, his son Johnny, passed away. Uh, and if you, you, I didn't really know Johnny that well, only met him on a few occasions, but if you, if you knew Jack, you knew Johnny, because he was a chip off the block, if you will. He was just like a, a, his father in so many of his ways. Uh, he, he passed away. and. I, I, I also had the opportunity to do his wedding when he married Ingrid. Uh, she was from Holland. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. But anyway, I, it was been almost 40 years ago. It would be 40 years in July that I did their, did their wedding here at the Rocky Ridge Church. So please remember Ingrid. Uh, remember uh, their children. Remember their family uh, in prayer this morning with me. Uh, there are so many other things in which uh, should bring our hearts to the Lord. Uh, our thanksgiving, our praise certainly uh, draws our hearts to him often. And as we pray, these are things that we certainly have the opportunity as a group to share together. All of us are a blessed people. We have our problems. We have our challenges in our lives, uh, things that may be very difficult right now that we're going through. But we know the one who loves us is greater than the things that try to take us down. He keeps holding us up, and he is our strength uh, because he loves us. So we rejoice in him today. And as we pray, we pray for one another as we are gathered here, for those of you gathered with us online as well. We remember those of our church family that are struggling right now, that are, are going through some difficult things. Some of them, uh, it's physical in nature. Others uh, are, are being challenged, not just through the, the physical problems they may have, their, 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 their ailments, but, but because of uh, other struggles they're having to deal with in their lives. It could be a financial uh, nature. It could be something that uh, has to do with, uh, with, with their job that is not going very well with them at this time. It could be within their families. Uh, and we all have struggles there from time to time. Uh, there's all kinds of things that uh, we don't often hear because those kinds of things are generally kept, uh, if you will, within 
the privacy of the, of the individual and their, maybe their immediate family. But we still need to be mindful of the fact that that's often the case around us and, and be sure to remember one another in prayer, not only for what we are aware of, but what we've not necessarily yet been made aware of. So let us do all of that as we go before the Lord in prayer. Let us give thanks again that we are here uh, together, that uh, we are a people called to serve him, uh, a part of a, of a legacy of people who have served him here through the Rocky Ridge Church from years past, and we continue uh, in that ministry here now. Uh, we are few in number, and, uh, but uh, our Lord was never impressed with numbers. Uh, he could make them big, he could make them small, but they were great, whatever they were, because of him. So uh, he, he, our greatness is not found in, in ourselves apart from God, but it's found in ourselves because of him and with God working in us and through us. Let's ask him to continue to bless us because it's our heart's desire to continue to be a blessing, to not only bring us together, but to send us out and all that we might serve him wherever his heart desires for us to go. Would y'all join me as we pray? Father, we come before you this morning again with grateful hearts, and indeed we bring our praise and thanksgiving to you, acknowledging you for who you are. Uh, it's not that we have to count our blessings. The fact that we know you and you have us is our blessing, and the source of everything else that comes from that and all is because of who you are. So we give thanks for that. And we're grateful that as we come before you today at this time, we are able to share in concerns that are mutual to us because of our love for one another, not just in our personal lives, but in the fact of, of the family that we share together called Rocky Ridge. We, we come in light of all who are in need, and we hold them up before you, looking to you for their sake. We want to pause again to give gratitude and and thank you for blessing the church and for the way in which you have been, you have used this church family as your witness uh, over the years. And it's our desire that you would continue to do so, that you would give us a, a, a vision or a, a renewal, a vision for what you have in your heart for us as we go into the future of this year and for whatever time is still ahead of us beyond that. Help us, Father, to be faithful and all to continue to follow you, to be faithful, not only uh, looking to you for the guidance we need, but being obedient when that guidance is given. Again, it's with grateful hearts, Lord, that we look to you at this time on behalf of one another in light of what our community needs and our world, thanking you that the light that shines from heaven shines not only in us, but through us to all, to all that you expose us to, Father, in your Holy Spirit. Let it be done, as always, for your glory again, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible on this Pentecost Sunday, I, I, I'm going to preach on something that's not, uh, it has to do with the Holy Spirit, for sure, and, uh, but it's uh, a little different from uh, maybe what you might typically hear in light of the of being Pentecost Sunday. I want to talk about the call of God, the call of God. And I'm going to be sharing with you some verses that come from the book of Acts. Uh, I'm reading from the 13th chapter. I'm uh, going to look at the first three verses in that chapter, and that is going to be the basis for the thoughts that I feel God has laid upon my heart to share with yours today. Hear the reading of God's word. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius and of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And then there was Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them, and then they sent them off. That's the reading of God's word for the people of God today. 
I have the privilege of serving in this presbytery on a committee called uh, for probationers. Uh, and it's uh, the responsibility of this committee, among other things, uh, to receive those who wish to be a candidate for the ministry in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And when they offer themselves to us uh, for that purpose, as we are interviewing them in light of their offer and before we place them on the role of probationers, we ask them a number of questions. And one of the questions in which we ask them is this, how would you describe your sense of call? How would you describe your sense of call? That's something I remember being asked, you know, years and years ago. I, I remember when I was asked that question, and, and uh, I had not really really thought it out a lot until it was put before me. I can't remember how I answered it, but uh, since I am here today, evidently I, I satisfied the ears of those that heard it. Uh, uh, but it's an interesting thing. How would you describe your sense of call? And while you're thinking about that and, and, and how a candidate might answer it, uh, let me uh, share something else with you. I believe every Christian has a calling which is shared with every other Christian. And we call this particular calling the general calling or God's general calling for our lives. I believe, for instance, all of us were called to salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That God called our name, he called out to us and we chose to respond in a positive way when we received Jesus, and through him we were reconciled to God. Another calling that all Christians share is the call to sanctification, which, is simply, means, which simply means we, were, we have been set apart for God's purposes, each and every one of us. We understand that, that we are no longer servants of this world, but we are servants of God for whatever his heart desires. And we are to abstain from the things that would otherwise keep us from being that vessel that God could use. And we're to take hold of the things that help make us, make us a vessel, vessel that is worthy to serve our Lord. And now there's a third way I believe that we are all called, not only to salvation and to sanctification, but to service. All of us are called to serve the Lord. None of us are called and then left idle, if you will. Uh, we all have a reason for being within the family of God. Every one of us has some sort of way in which we can serve the Lord and we can serve one another and even serve God in our community. We all have a call to service. Paul, when he writes to the Romans in the 12th chapter, I, I like how he says, this is, he said in light of this, we are to live our lives in such a way as to outdo one another. In, way of, in the way of serving, to outdo one another in the building up of the kingdom of God. So this should be the desire of every child of God, to serve the Lord and to serve one another in the Lord. Now these are what I call general callings because every Christian, every Christian and all, has experienced these calls for their lives. But I also believe there is another way in which we are called, which is what I'm going to refer to as a specific calling. Now, I'm not going to get into all the technology, uh, techn uh, te yeah, technical <laughs> calls there are. Yeah, I need more water. There's a lot of ways in which we are, we are called, and I, I'm not going, I can't go there today. I'm not going to try. But I want to talk about being specifically called. I believe there's ways, there's things in which God has in his, his mind and his heart for you. There's things he has purpose for your life and for mine that are unique to who we are because of the way in which we are made the way we we are shaped our desires our disposition all all these kinds of things uh, factor into the, what brings this call about or leads us to the understanding of this call I believe there's a calling that is specific in the sense that it's unique it's unique. It's not that there's no one else who's been called to the ministry to preach. <laughs> yeah, for sure, there are many, many more. But there's a way in which that God has called me to minister that is unique in the sense of who I am and the way in which God is able to work in me and through my life. 
Paul saw his own personal calling as being unique. And he refers to this again in his letter to the Romans, among other places. In the very first verse, in chapter 1 of Romans, he said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Well, that's unique. I don't know that there is anyone since then who has been called to be an apostle as Paul was an apostle. I'm not sure about that, but I don't think so. But set apart for the gospel of God, that's something I can understand and I can identify with. Going back to the candidate, when he's asked the question or she's asked the question, and uh, you know, what, what, how would you describe your sense of call? I want you to think about this today. I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe is unlike anything I have asked of you. But I want you to think about God's specific call for your life. It may be something you're already familiar with, you've already dealt with, and it may be something you have otherwise have not really thought much about. And if it's been, if God has called you in such a way, you can't really see where it was or when when that call came or what it was for. Well, I'm going to give you some things here within this 13th chapter that go along with this this particular sense of call that may help you out. So first thing I want you to notice here in, in this 13th chapter is that the call of God in this manner is personal. It's personal. And when I begin my reading here, uh, I notice that there are a lot of people gathered together in the church at Antioch and their prophets and teachers. And then he names some people specifically, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean, and Saul. But when you go on and read, you find why I say God's call is personal, because when the, the call is given for this ministry that is being, that is being described here, only two names are mentioned. And the names of Barnabas and Saul, who we know as Paul. They are the two. This is no disrespect, there's certainly no slight to the other men of God who were, I'm sure, also desiring to serve their Lord. But sometimes God calls people to do something, calls a person to do something specifically. And we can't look around and wait for what everybody else is going to do because that call is not theirs, it's yours. And it's meant for you to hear it and for you to respond to it. Have you ever thought about God having something specific in mind for your life? That God has something that he intends for you and no one else to do. It's in his heart that it might also find its place within your heart as well. I think it's important that we, that we realize that God deals with us in this way. He's a personal God. And while, while he certainly has laid a lot of things out there that all of us can see and we can all certainly understand and respond to, there is going to be sometimes something that comes from him to you that's not going to come to anyone else. It's his personal call for you and for something that he has in mind for your life. There's another thing that stands out to me in this, these verses. Not only is that call personal, but it's purposeful too, isn't it? God's call is purposeful when it's given in this manner. He said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. And now this is the, uh, this is the same wording that, is, that Paul later on uses in one of his letters when he writes to the church at Galatia. He mentions this in the first chapter, in the 15th verse, and all, when he, he says, and all, that God set me apart from birth and has called me from my mother's womb. Now, I don't understand all that very well. I really don't. Uh, I understand it in some ways better than I did long ago, but I still sometimes, you know, it, it's still bigger than I am or greater than my understanding or ability to think. 
But I believe God had me in his heart before I even was born. He had me in his mind and his heart. And he had something spe specific he wanted me to do with my life. I wasn't put in this world by accident, regardless of what anyone else will tell you. <laughs> I'm not an accident. <laughs> I have accidents, <laughs> but I'm not one <laughs> as far as being here in this world. But you know when it started becoming real to me? It wasn't until after the fact of, of being born again and being saved that my eyes were open and suddenly, man, you've been talking to me all along and I never did hear you. For when I was 10 years old, it was my mama Willis that first told me, Dwayne, God has, I believe God is going to make you a minister. Now she also said, fair, to be fair, he's going to either make you a minister or a baseball player. Yeah, I had two at-bats. I struck out and I popped up. Uh, that's the story of my baseball career. <laughs> but she spoke those words, and I believe those words were the words God put in her heart for me to hear. When I had become a Christian and was still young, I, I was still, my heart was desiring to serve God, and yet I, I still couldn't figure out how I was going to, to do this. And there was a young lady who was in a, what we call it, a share group. And we were in a, a small group, and she looked over at me, and she said, her name was Barbara, and she said, Dwayne, have you ever thought that God may be calling you to the ministry? And I thought to myself, that's really hard to imagine that he would call me to that because I'm so young in Christ, and I don't even know what it means to be a church member, much less to preach to a bunch of them. <laughs> You know, but he's, he's speaking to your heart so many ways. And I wonder how many times God has said things through others to you or in different ways. And maybe you and I weren't really listening or able to fully comprehend. But I'm telling you, God is speaking to our hearts. And he does it in a way that is purposeful because he has something in mind for you that he wants you to do. When the Holy Spirit spoke to these people and said, set apart for me Paul and, Barnab and, and, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and all, he had something in mind for their lives. And it's not that he didn't have other things in mind for the other people's lives, but, it was, but in this case, it was, it was for these two people. It was personal, but it was purposeful because God had these men in his heart to serve him in a special way. And I believe he does that with all of us. I really do. I'm either still that naive or, or unwilling to, to, to change my way of thinking after all these years, but I believe God has something specific in terms of his purpose for you. The third thing that comes to my attention here is that what God is calling them to do is practical. In, ter in, in other words, it, he is calling them to do something. And I'll not just to, to be something, but to do something. You know, when God called me into the ministry, and, and I, he didn't call me to, to get a title and, and, and then to sit down, and, 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 and that's the end of the story, if you will, as such. I don't believe any more than when he calls us to be Christians that that's the end of the story there either. It's just the beginning. When he called me to be in, into the ministry, he meant to put me to work. <laughs> he meant to, to put me into practice, if you will, to use me in, in some way or another. He said here in all that the, the ministry that they were being called to was a work that he had chosen for them to do. Now, I don't know what God has chosen in his heart for you to do. But uh, not only generally speaking what we all do, but something may be specific, but I believe he has. A good friend of mine who has gone home to be with the Lord now, Steve Bray, told me more than once. So many of us, in, uh, when we were coming together as young Christians, were sensing God's call to the ministry. Not everyone stayed the course. Steve didn't get caught up into the emotion of that. He knew he had ministry, he had a ministry, but he didn't feel like it had to be done in the way that I'm doing my ministry. He felt that, and he finally shared with me one day, this is what God is calling me to do. He is calling me to teach. 
I said, Sunday school? He said, no, to teach. And I, he said, I don't know how God's going to do this, but I think he's putting me in the classroom to be able to be a light and somehow or another to convey Jesus Christ to the students, not only to teach them social studies and history and the other things that I have been prepared to teach, but also my heart's been prepared to share Jesus, and somehow God's going to use me. When we went to his funeral service down in Mobile, there were a lot of young people there, a lot of young people who remembered Mr. Bray, and they remembered his testimony. They remembered him as a, a man who really cared, who really loved. They remembered him as someone who, who respected them, but also who challenged them to have a respect for themselves. And also, as he had opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When I say God's call for you is practical, I like what I read one time. It was on the, on the wall of a I don't know if it was in another minister's office or where it was, but it said this. It says, when we are walking in the Spirit, we do not wear out the seat of our pants, but the soles of our shoes. We're actively doing it. And I think that's what God intends. It always bothered me when someone would tell me, well, I don't really feel that I'm really equipped to serve God other than to take my place in the pew. I don't believe that about any Christian. Any Christian. I, re I, I remember one dear old lady who, who, had, who had been very active and she taught Sunday school, she sang in a choir. This was a lady who, who really uh, gave her all in, in many different ways in serving God and had come to the point in her life because of her age and her health that she couldn't do these things. And she was at home, and I went by to visit her on this particular occasion, and she said to me, she said, Brother Pounds, she said, I am so frustrated because I can't serve the Lord anymore. And before I could even answer that, there was a call on her phone, and it was one of her neighbors that had a, a problem. I don't know what the problem was, but she said, uh, can you tell me a time when I could come over and you could talk with me, and I could talk with you? And she set up a time for her. And then she also uh, was, uh, told me about other people. She said, you know, it's sort of strange. And I've got my neighbors and people calling me up like this, wanting to come over and, or, or for me to pray with them. I said, don't you see? God has given you a special calling here to minister and to serve the people. When you can't go to them, he brings them to you. Isn't that wonderful? We've got a God who understands our limitations, but who has no limitations. And when we can't do it one way, it's okay. He will make it, he'll make it possible for it to be done another way. He just wants our availability, as you've often heard. He'll provide what is needed in terms of ability. He just wants us to be available and to be also obedient when the opportunities come. So we, when I, when I read this about this call, the thing that I think about when it's something specific in God's heart for us, it's going to be personal. It's going to be personal. It's not something I can hand off. <laughs> you know, yeah, God's called me to the ministry, so uh, would you go and do it on my behalf? It's something he intends for my life. It's purposeful because it, it's, it has meaning. And, and it's something that, that is going to make a difference, a difference in the world in which we live. It's practical. It's something that has to be done, not just said, but done. And we're always about doing. Even when we can't do what we have done, we are still doing in whatever way we are enabled to do. And let me tell you a fourth thing that I read here, and this is the thing that I remind myself of, when it comes to my own specific call or anyone else's, it's providential. It's providential. It comes from God. Set apart. The, the word said, the Holy Spirit said. And then he says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work in which I have called them. You know, I came before a committee uh, uh, for probationers for the ministry. 
And I, I, I sat under their guidance and direction. But I didn't need them to validate my ministry as much because my ministry had been validated by the Holy Spirit who had put it in my heart to do it. I'm glad that they agreed with the Holy Spirit and that they worked along uh, and guidance with the Spirit to, to direct me in light of the way in which I was going. But God's calling for your life is that. It's God's calling. It comes from Him, from the highest source. Something we should never forget. You know, Paul was getting, these people were laying hands on him and on Barnabas for this particular occasion, for this particular reason. But Paul already had a hand laid upon him before this. It was the hand of Jesus, wasn't it? When Jesus told him and all, he said to him, go to the house of Judas and Straight Street and ask for the man of uh, ask, uh, uh, Tarsus or in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias and I have sent him to you because I have chosen him and I have called him to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings before all the people of Israel it comes from God isn't it exciting you know I, I feel so small I really do I feel so small, and, and, and I feel as inadequate in, in many instances as any of you would ever feel. I really do. To imagine that a great God who is beyond our ability to fully comprehend by any means, come even close, has something special in mind for my life, and yet he does, and he does for yours as well. Something that that is from his heart. You know, I'm glad he put it on my grandmama Willis's heart, but even if he hadn't, it would still have been valid. I, I'm glad he put it on my friend Barbara's heart, but if, if he hadn't, it still would have been valid. And I'm glad he put it in the hearts of my, uh, of, of my uh, committee on probationers who watched over me, cared for me, and, and encouraged me. But if he hadn't, it would have still been valid because it was from him. God has something for you, whether others ever know it or not, or even appreciate it or not, it still matters. It's still important to your life because it's, a, it's all about who you are and what your life is meant to be. So I want to close with one other thought today, and that is this. God's specific call for you as his general call for your life in any way is also pleasurable. It's pleasurable. I didn't say it's easy because it's not. And I didn't say it was always exciting because it won't be. But it is fulfilling. It is fulfilling. I cannot imagine my life having served my Lord as long as I have served him to this day doing anything other than what I've done. Some of us were talking before the service started earlier and I, I, think, uh, I think it was Terry that asked uh, me, he said, Preacher, whenever are you going to retire? Oh, he didn't say it that way. I'm sorry, Terry. <laughs> we both said, can you imagine retiring from something you love, from something that, you, that you've had in your heart all your life? And, and I can't. I know the day will come when I will have to for some reason, but it's awfully hard to, to imagine it. It's so much a part of me, and God made that real for me that I can't imagine anywhere else that I would be closer, closer to him than where I am right now. And that's where I want to be, close to my God. I want you to listen to this, and I'm going to bring my message to a close here. I, I, this comes from a passage you're all very familiar with. It comes, again, from the book of Romans. I've shared this with you several times, I think once or twice even recently. Out of the 12th chapter of Romans, there in verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you'll do this, then, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It was Adrian Rogers that I heard say, on more than one occasion, 
You know, friends, you would want what God wants for you if you had enough sense to know <laughs> what God knows. <laughs> you would want it. You wouldn't want anything else because you know you couldn't get anything else better than that. And it pleases God when I am becoming the person that he has called me to be through his son, Jesus Christ. And it pleases him when I'm doing what he has specifically designed for me to do through the power of his spirit. And you know something, I find pleasure in doing it myself. I know I'm right where he wants me to be, and I want you to know that. Perhaps you already do, and if you do, that's wonderful, and if not, I want you to know it. I don't want you to mess out on that. I want you to be able to experience a fullness in your walk with the Lord. It's more than just being called to be saved, but if you haven't been saved, I hope you hear his call and you respond to his spirit and come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. It's his call for us to be sanctified and I hope we have put ourselves in a position where we are set apart for the purposes of God. And surely it's his call for us to serve him. And I hope you are in some way, even though you might not fully understand what God's heart is for you, yet you are, you are busy in serving the Lord as he leads you. But would you ask God, is there something more? Is there something specific that you have in your heart for me that I have not yet heard? Like the little boy Samuel, Remember when he was awakened, he heard a voice and he thought it was Eli. And he went to Eli and he said, he asked him what it was that he was calling him for. He said, I hadn't called you, son. Going back to sleep. He heard it again shortly thereafter. And he got up and he went back. He said, Here I am. And Eli said, Son, I'm not calling you. But then he understood. He said, It's God. It's God who calls you. Next time he calls, you ask him to speak to you. And so he went back and yet, and then again, the third time, he heard the voice call out to him. And this time he said, here I am, Lord. It is I. Speak to me. Maybe that would be my prayer today, or your prayer, if we need to hear from God. Let's just ask him, Lord, here we are. Speak to us. Which is simply saying, I'm listening. I'm listening. What do you want to say to me? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you. I thank you for the many ways in which you call out to us and speak to us through your word, through others who have a heart for you, and you use them as a witness to us. Through the, sometimes it's the, the things that happen around us and the experiences of life, and yet sometimes it's a voice that's yet not audible, but a voice nonetheless. Your still small voice that calls out to us and shares something with us just for us, for your glory and for our good. To you be the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and we'll sing uh, our closing hymn. This is our final act of worship today through the giving of our tithes and offerings. We have a plate that has been placed on the table out here in the foyer. If you would like to uh, put your uh, 
your, your tithe or your offering in that plate as you are dismissed, and th this will be your opportunity to do so. But hear the word of God in preparation for this. It comes from the Old Testament, from First Chronicles. Uh, it's out of the uh, uh, 29th chapter and the 14th verse. These are the words. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, Lord, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. How blessed we are. This is our opportunity to share that blessing through our gifts this morning. Let us pray. Father, as we leave here today, we thank you for this final act of worship that we are able to give again to you only because you have given to us. And uh, we, you are our source that enables us to be generous, to be godly, and uh, to be able to live good and consistent lives that honor you. Bless the offerings that we bring before you today, and bless us, Father, as we're dismissed in your spirit. Lead us through this day according to your heart's desire. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.